Hi there, welcome to or welcome back to the Shift Control Podcast. My name is Paul McAnallen. Thanks for joining me for episode 19 of the Shift Control Podcast, which is uh, in conversation with Enda McNulty. For those of you who don't know Enda, Enda was uh, part of the Armagh team that won the All-Ireland in 2002, who subsequently went on to win seven Ulster titles at a time when Ulster titles were very hard to win. And following her very, very successful career in GAA, and I set up a business consultancy that specialised in creating high-performance teams for some of the biggest brands in the world, uh, operating from Dublin, but working with businesses globally. Um, really has been, really is an example of, of, a, of, a, of a man who can take the skills of high-performance in sport and take it to the boardroom. He makes some very interesting comments. I have to say that this was probably, again, one of those really interesting conversations to have with somebody who's working at at an elite elite level. Um, And he makes some interesting observations about that uh, very predictable uh, comparison between high-performance sport and business. Um, Some very obvious differences we discuss. He talks about um, working with some of those brands uh, globally, that the difficulty that some of the big companies have in trying to have this syndicated culture across their entire workforce. So again, we've talked about that before. Talks about the importance of culture. Um, if you're trying to create um, <clears throat> any kind of performance improvement with teams, uh, something that has to be uh, a very, very solid platform for any further development to be built on. And um, again, kind of a uh, some interesting observations that he makes from his time in sport and from his time in business. Really enjoyed the the chat with Enda. Very interesting guy, very um, easy on the ear, very, very approachable too for somebody who's operating at, you know, um, at a very, at the top level. I was very grateful to get him to appear on, on the show. So without any more chat from me, I really hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed recording it um, last week. So without any further ado, let me introduce Enda McNulty. Enda, thanks very much for joining me uh, this evening. I know you've had a, a very busy day and your time's precious. So genuinely, thank you for, for joining up here. It's a complete pleasure, Paul. Uh, I love the stories you shared off air about throwing football, about your role with Queen's University, uh, brilliant to share your passions and working with sales teams. Uh, and of course, fascinated by your experience working with Premier League clubs uh, in sponsorship and marketing. That's a fascination. It, it, you know what? It was, um, a, it was a very interesting time. It was a good time to be working in that space. It's, it was a long time ago. You're looking at 1999, you know, but there was the year Manchester United won the treble. And uh, whilst it wasn't um, a year that I would look back professionally with, with a lot of fondness, I ended up seeing Manchester United play Barcelona 3 all at a Old Trafford and we ended up going to see uh, this, like Inter Milan, Internazional against Roma in the San Siro and it was a lot of, a lot of fun in that respect, you know. So um, I, I know your background flat out here um, and I'm just going to try and piece together some of the bits that I know. Um, I, I don't remember you f- all that well from the RMA success in, in 2002, but... but that, dude, it's okay, Paul. It wasn't that good, so I'm not, I'm not that surprised. <laughs> no. No, well, I'll check, that, I'll check that out later, so that's okay. <laughs> but but the, um, what, I, what I am very interested in, and I'd like you to kind of j- sort of join the dots, is the background from a very successful career in, in GAA um, for, at university football, at the very highest level um, at university football, and then that kind of very seamless transition from sport into business to take you where you are now, working with some of the largest, um, most well-known tech brands, uh, fintech, finance, uh, household brand names. So maybe just to kind of piece all that together, if you could. Yeah, well, it's interesting, Paul. You've said already some very nice things about me there. I'd be more interested in your listeners to your podcast. I would love that me and you could get into their cars or into their offices or into their boardrooms, maybe into their hearts and minds at this time and empathize with them because every one of your listeners are going through the single biggest business challenge 
of the last hundred years. No doubt. Start with that. Rather than talking about myself, I'm not going to bore your listeners talking about myself. I would start with genuinely thinking about where they are currently in their businesses, where they currently are with their challenging P&Ls. I'm sure a lot of them, their revenues have fallen off cliffs, like a lot of our clients all around the world. And when me and you were prepping and you were sending me very detailed emails in advance, Paul, I made myself a promise that I wouldn't start by talking to myself and who I'm working with and what we're doing. Because to be honest with you, I'm sure your listeners don't really cure. What the cure is, how can they get through the next 90 days and have enough cash headroom to survive? I'm sure what the cure about is, how the hell do they pivot? Yeah. I'm sure with all your experience, Paul, what they cure about is, how are they going to get enough uh, to allow them to continue to hire uh, maybe that one extra person that's going to make the difference or hold on to those 10 really loyal people or 20 or 50 or 100. As one company I was talking to today, they currently have 50,000 people globally and they're going to have to get rid of 10% of them. So it is the single biggest business challenge of the last 100 years or arguably in history. And that, I would say, I'm more fascinated about than talking about Enda. Well, well, let's, well okay, I know we'll, we'll eventually get back around to you again then. But st- st- starting with that, um, you know, pe- people are, uh, there are businesses that are still surviving and thriving through all of this. But... But do, do you see it as um, the, the damage and the scar tissue that's been left behind with, with individuals? Are you seeing it from a team context? Are you seeing it from a, a performance context? What do you see the biggest problem right now with your clients? Really good question. I spoke to a guy leading a global tech business over the last uh, few weeks, and he said to me that when he hears people giving an insight to the response and reaction to COVID and the impact for the long term, he says for him, it's far too soon to know. And he says, none of us really know what the impact is going to be, what the scar tissue is going to be, what's the long-term impact of this on how we work, on how we sell, on how we lead teams, on how we manage teams, on our corporate culture, on our business culture. He says it's far too soon to know. And for me, that soon grounded me in a bit of wisdom. This guy's been in business for 40 years. It grounded me in wisdom that, I don't know, uh, Paul, what the big scars are going to be yet. I don't know what the big, you know, let's say paradigm change are going to be in business for the next 10 or 20 years. What I do know is the remarkable impact it's having on people's lives. What I do know is the transfer, transformational behavioral impact this has had already. Yeah. What I do know is, and you mentioned earlier on about your partner, the psychological impacts this is having, and your partner was mentioning the people she's meeting on a daily, weekly basis that has hugely impacted their psychological well-being. So the trends we're seeing would be probably under four or five key headings. One, huge psychological and emotional challenges. Two, revenues falling off cliffs for lots of businesses, of course, in tourism, uh, in the, let's say, in the hospitality industry in particular, obviously the aviation industry, mega uh, revenues falling off cliffs. Uh, Number two. Number three, huge challenge around knowing how to lead people in a virtual world. Uh, Number four, sales and marketing teams trying to figure out how do we continue to sell, of course, in a digital world, and of of course using e-commerce, but how do we go about doing that? If we hadn't already started that, but before the start of 2020. Uh, Five, lack of connectivity uh, and therefore a lack of almost soul because I used to have very good trust of a manager. I used to meet him or her every day, but now I only see them on a Zoom call and I'm losing the connectivity with them. So the, the CEOs are saying to us on small organizations on medium and global, they're saying to us, Uh, how the hell do I reconnect with them? Number five, and maybe number six, uh, uh, loneliness. Uh, I spoke to a doctorate in leadership in the last 24 hours and spending the whole day with her tomorrow. She's a PhD in leadership. She has 30 years experience in leading and coaching around the world. And she said the amount of women and men she's made in the corporate world who are suffering from loneliness is mega. 
so that's what we're experiencing at the moment. I hope that answers your question, Paul. That's really, uh, that's a, an, an excellent summary. And I'd, I'd love to, I'm just going to jump in there with any one of them. That's okay. Um, you, you see all the, the, the benefits that technology brings and this kind of interconnected, the ability for us to have this conversation and the ability to, to, to speak to uh, anyone anywhere in the world and maybe continue those sales conversations. Um, but with that, you know, what price does that, what price does culture take then? You know, how, how can you create a culture within a business where everybody's working from uh, a home office or 80% of people are working from a home office? On top of that, you know, layer in the different um, age groups of people. So it's okay for, for a younger cohort to be able to adapt very quickly to this because it's what they know. Um, but there are a lot of other people, and, and I'm happy to throw my age in the middle of that, who aren't maybe um, as tech savvy as I might be, but, but who will miss that connectivity. What impact is that really going to have on, on a cultural foundation of a business? Yeah, I think it's a great question. You know, how is this impacting culture? How is it impacting culture foundation? I love that phraseology. I believe firmly, Paul, if we haven't been working very hard on our cultural uh, values, behaviors, principles in the last five years, if we haven't worked and put that foundation in and COVID hit us, we're in trouble. So I'm not going to burst that underneath this virtual carpet uh, with you this evening if we haven't been working hard on our culture on our values on our behaviors on our cultural compass on our leadership principles in the last five or ten years in our business teams or in our smb on our non-profit whoever your listeners are uh, chiming in from around the world i would have to say uh you know they're in trouble there's no doubt about that it's a bit like saying that if, if we haven't put in the foundation stones in our house and we hadn't put in the concrete, we hadn't still worked in, and a big storm comes, you're bloody in trouble. Now, that isn't to say we can't help and hopefully inspire those people in this session and in this podcast this evening. Uh, I think we can still help them, Paul, uh, and we can still give them some really practical, pragmatic advice. Uh, but maybe there's a warning shot there for all of us that be fixing be fixing our culture now because one thing we're sure is there's more adversity ahead. Yeah. And even if your culture is very good now, be investing in it. That's if you're a sports team, like a Throne GA or an Armagh GA or a global tech business that I spent two and a half hours with uh, just before the session this evening. We have to invest in our culture and it has to be ongoing, proactive, relentless investment in our culture. There's a couple of... Um... So what, what I'm doing with businesses that I work with would be mainly sales training and, and sales strategy and uh, business development strategy. You do a lot of skills development and you're working with, with boys that um, are doing stuff well. And it's that old saying, what got you out of Egypt is not going to get you to the promised land. So you've used the skill set to get you to here and now it's pushing on. And there's a, a kind of a universal feeling that I, that, I, that I sense anyway, is that people are realizing the importance of that concrete you know, that, that foundation is culture. And then actually culture becomes the curtains in the building. It becomes the doors. It becomes the, the floorboards. It becomes everything. And, and for a lot of uh, businesses of a certain age and a certain type, that's a big shift in thinking, you know. And it's fun to watch some of those businesses struggle with the whole idea that culture is not actually, uh, you know, something on the, the board meeting agenda. Culture, culture is a continuum. It's a forever. I 100% agree. I have nothing to add to that other than fully agree. Who's doing it well at the minute? I mean, can, can you just loosely point to every single big tech company and say no. that, yeah, they've all got it right? No. Some, so. of the tech, some of the big tech companies, uh, there's hot spots of amazing culture and there's cold spots of toxic culture. Yeah. Some of the big sporting organizations, as you know, from your own portfolio experience, some aspects of the culture is amazing and it's high performance and it's, you know, let's say curing and it's very, let's say, loyal and trusting and other aspects, it's rotten uh, to the core. So lots of the big tech companies you work with and pharma companies and fintech companies and manufacturing companies and so on, you come across some amazing hotspots. I was asked one time by a global tech business to travel all around the world and meet 
all of their uh, leaders in all of their regional operating centers. And even though it was the same company across all those regional operating centers, we spotted unbelievable difference in culture. Same pay scale, same bonus scale, same uh, values, same products, same services, same marketing, same ways of working, all of the above, but you spotted a massive difference in the culture when we went to, let's say, into uh, North America, South uh, Asia, North Asia, and so on. So for me, there's no company that's got it perfect right across the entire global enterprise, none of them. Yeah. Some of them have got, again, more prominence of good aspects of culture. And maybe a good way for your, your clients and your listeners to think about that, Paul, would be if we imagine the Catholic Church, one of the biggest organizations in the world, one of the longest existing organizations in the world, if not the longest existing, right? Now, there's aspects of the Catholic Church, as we all know, are rotten to the core. And there's aspects of the Catholic Church that we've all experienced is toxic. There's aspects of the Protestant Church that's incredible and loyal and loving and supportive and caring and community-centric. And there's aspects of it that are rotten. So I, whenever I look at organizations, I'm not looking for a, a broad brush. I'm really interested in sometimes bird's eye view, sometimes worm's eye view, sometimes helicopter view, sometimes 747 view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, um, trust, trust is evidently a big part of all of this. Trust is, again, some of the, 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 the more um, rigid ingredients in culture. You know, it's a... Um, there's a girl uh, I've referenced her a few times in the podcast, Rachel Bossman. She does a brilliant podcast, written a book on the, the inverted trust stack about how institutional trust, you mentioned the Catholic Church, you can mention the BBC, you can mention the finance companies, you can mention um, media companies who we all kind of believed in for a long time blindly. And then all of a sudden, everything was carped in its head. And so it's all about restoring <laughs> trust from the ground up, you know, and if you don't have the culture right, like, I mean, so you talk about all these things loosely and very, like, not, not anecdotally, but, but there's empirical evidence out here for these very, the softer skills that we used to talk about, you know? Where, it's, funny, it's funny you use that word, kiped. The only, only people in the world, I think, that use that word, kiped, must be Northern Ireland and, and Ulster guys and girls, is it? So probably. Can... <laughs> probably. This comes with subtitles, so we're dead on. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> But it, 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 as your listeners will hear, my two stars of the business, Zoe and Sharon, are leaving in the background here. So I okay. call out Zoe and Sharon. They're they're away next door to, to clean the well-being studio next door. Sharon's telling me, "Thank you very much, girls. Much appreciated." It never sleeps, man. It just never sleeps, does it? It's just <laughs> it's, it's ongoing, like yeah. Um, so so with the work that you do with businesses, then is it is are you like? Um, from McNulty performance perspective, you cover a wide range of areas of specialism, but you know, and I, these names are on your website. So you can talk about Diageo and you can talk about Google and you can talk about Amazon and the IRFU. You, you, you go in and, and everything is, is predicated on the right kind of culture. Everything you do. Yeah. Culture. Very good question. One of the key areas we focus in is high performance culture. Another one would be high performance leadership high-performance teams, high-performance coaching, well-being, resilience, and mindset. So very uh, much we're focusing those swim lanes. Okay. Somebody was asked also, we experts in, earlier on we were chatting with a company that do SAP implementation. And we've done a lot of that in the past, believe it or not, but we don't do the SAP technology implementation. We work on the well-being, leadership, team, cultural aspect. So those are the swim lanes we stick to. Uh, and we're trying to, like, like Steve Jobs, I guess, would speak about trying to focus on those swim lanes because we know that if we try to be brilliant in all the swim lanes, let's say in a 50-meter pool, we're going to be average. Yeah. We're, we're going to be uh, maybe complacent and arrogant and think we can do well in, let's say, marketing or in uh, sales training, not our expertise. So the, the high-performance... Um is something that I get asked about a lot with clients um, or um, um, no, performance improvement, okay? Yeah. Because there's, n there's not really, there's many def uh, definitions of high performance and most businesses that you work with will tell you that they're working at a really high performance, but it's a very, very microscopic view that they have. They don't have the, the exterior view, they only have themselves to look at. 
Is it? I, I'm gonna just throw this at you. How would you? How would you define high performance? Like, what? What do you say it is? High performance team. I would say I was defining that is a group of people that work relentlessly in pursuit of very ambitious targets. They can they achieve them consistently, and are absolutely unapologetic for underperformance. That would make a quick definition of a high performance team. Okay. Okay. High performance leadership then. High performance Same thing leadership. A little bit more. Yeah. High performance leadership is, I guess, uh, an everyday pursuit to be the best you can be to achieve very ambitious organizational or team goals uh, and create a culture in which that becomes the norm. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, Phil Neville was on a podcast with Jake Humphreys and Damian Hughes recently. And, and the way he, his language is just beautiful. Like he talks about this relentlessness, you know, this incessant, this just, and, and he talks about it with like, doesn't everybody do that? And he, he talked about the time he went to Everton and he was taking with him all of the values that he had inculcated from Manchester United. Like so, and he was going to Everton and he was the first one to training and the last one out of training. And he just said like, right, that's it. I can't, where is everybody? You know, and it's reflected in, in performance and scores and, and, and so on and so forth. So does everybody like, um, do, do every, does every business um, embrace the idea the same way, but does not, everybody doesn't follow the rigor in the same way, presumably? I, th I think it's, it's an interesting uh, debate. Uh, it's an interesting, I guess, topic to discuss and dissect. I I'll never be good enough at understanding high performance. I spent my whole life trying to know more about it, study it, learn from the best at it, travel around the world to try and get a smell or a sniff of it and, and you know, trying to grab hold of it literally but I'll never know enough about it. I think if anybody says that they know enough about high performance, they're probably bluffing. Uh, I don't know nearly enough about it, but I'm fascinated about it. Uh, there is a huge resistance, of course, in lots of organizations about when they hear high performance you mentioned, because if you say to somebody, I'm here as your high performance coach, I'm here to help you become a high performance team, immediately they're going, oh, hold on a second. Yeah. You know, we've hit all our sales targets. We're already hitting the balls out of the ballpark. Or, or Jesus, does, is he saying that we're underperforming? So I've learned from all those mistakes about how you introduce that subject to an organization or a team or maybe even to a leader. So yes, you meet a lot of resistance and skepticism and doubt and all the usual emotions associated with change. Because yeah. if, if you're going on a, a change curve from underperforming to high performing, it's bloody painful. As your listeners all know, as you know, Paul, because you've been there and you're both in sporting experience and business experience and in life experience, we'd all been there. When I started off playing with Armagh, we were, I think, something like number 26 in Ireland. We went to number one. And then, unfortunately, we went back down to probably number 10. It was painful on the way up and it was even more painful on the way down. So when people hear the words high performance, everybody in the world is savvy enough to know it's one hell of a journey to get there. It's like not only climbing Mount Everest, but it's like climbing Mount Everest and dragging people up the bloody hill. It's incredibly difficult. And yes, it's harder than sport. It's harder than Man United. And we work with the Premier League clubs and we work with them. It's harder than Gary or Phil Neville have experienced. It's harder than what we experienced with Armagh. It's harder than, God rest them, your cousin Cormac and Alan experienced with Tyrone. It's harder because with a football team, you've got everybody who wants to go and win. They're all on the same page. They all want to win the All-Ireland or the Premier League or the, let's say, the, uh, the Ryder Cup, right? They want to win it. But in business, somebody might just be happy with a nine to five. They might be happy doing a two day a week. Yeah. They might be happy to get their 40K salary sitting in Belfast in a, uh, let's say, in a public sector body. They don't want to become a high performance team. They're just happy with the paycheck. Why would they want to be a high performance team? So for me, business and organizational performance is actually much more difficult than the elite professional sports teams or non-for-profit teams or teams who work within adventure. That's a really uh, interesting point. Yeah, that's um, I, I, what some of the uh, parallels are, are obviously there. You know, you can talk about 
your you know deliberate practice or a purposeful practice in certain elements of sales training and that. But if the Cubs getting up and going to work and is just interested in nine to five and switching off and then you can't, you can't fire that spark. But the, but even you know like there's some of the other things that um, it dawned on me. I, I can't remember where I read it and maybe with um, I, I can't remember where I read it, so I'm not going to reference anything. But there was an article on performance difference in performance in sport and performance in business where in sport you're you're training all week for something at the weekend and you've got recovery time and you've got nutrition and you've got sports psychs working with you and you've got everybody looking after whatever you know it is that you need to look after and i'm thinking of very moderate uh to aspirational soccer players for example who get 20 30 40 grand a week who are nowhere close to the pinnacle nowhere close to the pinnacle but they're getting looked after uh, finance uh, advice. They're getting all sorts of stuff. And then somebody who is a mid-range achiever in a certain business sector is working every day to fulfill a target. There's no training. There's no recovery. There's no sleep. There's no sports psych coming in to give them a pat on the back and rub the ankles and whatever else goes on. And, and so this sometimes the analogy between high-performance sport and high-performance in business, just like you've really, really articulated, is totally unfounded. You know, I, I totally agree with you. I'll give you an example. This week, I have 40 performances. When I was playing with Arma, I had one performance. Arma normally would have a big game maybe every three, four weeks. I've got 40 performances this week. There's not one of them that I can't perform in. Not one of them. And by the way, that's not even in my personal life. That's in my business life. Yeah. So if we look at a performance that we all have in our personal life, like if I go home tonight, to my wife, Julia, I'm, I'm already away from home 12 hours. But I can't go home tonight and say, well, I've had a very long day. Sorry, I'm going to bed. You have to show up at home and bring your best energy. So I think that we've, we in, in this sporting and business worlds have overly hackneyed or overused the sport business parallel. Now, of course, there's lots of things that will transcend into both and, and are parallels. But in some cases, a lot of women in particular in business get switched off by men and women in business and sport who keep always using the same parallels. I, a South African girl we have with us, Paul, uh, Kirsty Casey's her name. And when we start using the sport analogy, she says, stop, stop. I, I don't want to hear the sport analogies. I want to hear business analogies. I want to hear a small, medium-sized enterprise in Cape Town or Johannesburg who's doing what we do and what's the parallels? Why are we using the English cricket team or the Armagh football team or what? Who cares? I want to talk about business and P and Ls and sales and marketing and uh, let's say KPIs and KBIs and processes and systems, not who passed the ball to who. Yeah, that's 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 on the money. That's completely on the money. Yeah, and, and probably some of the clients I'm working with certainly aren't at the same scale and profile, but the same sentiment resonates. Um, the, an example that I would use in terms of high performance is a, an operating theater. You know, and you've got a consultant at 250 grand a year hovering over the body and you've got some woman or a man in the back who's on 25 grand a year nurse and you're hoping that they're all coming with their A game because if a 25 year old male nurse in the back was in the piss the night before and he's handing over a, a, a pair of pliers rather than, you know, the whole thing is up the left and, and it, it, you know, you don't have to talk about Ronan O'Gara all the time taking the money shot for against Northampton or whatever. It has to be something very, very real and very, very something that everybody can relate to. Well, grabbing that breaking ball to use that metaphor, I feel very strongly about that, Paul, and I'll tell you why. I've coached a girl who's an elite surgeon on baby's eyes. So she leads a high performance team in theater, probably five or six operations a day on baby's eyes. If she misses and messes up at her communication, that has a dramatic impact on that child's sight for life. Yeah. So we, we uh, in the last 20 years, have got a huge amount of experience, of course, in sport, but now we're probably even more passionate about what we're learning from teams in performance arts, obviously global business teams, but also in, in, in uh, performance crucibles like surgery yeah. and performance crucibles like uh, politics. So one of the guys that I've worked and learned a lot from over the last uh, couple of years is Brian Kahn, the ex Taoiseach. Like that, that is a completely different stratosphere than, you know, playing for Armagh. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Um, there's a, I don't know if you like your music or not. 
again, it was my, that'll be my passion above everything. And Eddie Van Halen died this week or last week. And um, Eddie Van Halen was a, like, he, he, play, he was a, Van Halen played maybe, I don't know, 60% of the soundtrack of me growing up as a 16 year old up on, on the Moy and that. And um, I remember like we were sending texts to a few buddies, like God, either he goes and all that sort of stuff. And um, I immediately went on to check out the response to his death by David Lee Roth. And there's a brilliant podcast by Joe Rogan and David Lee Roth from about three years ago. And they talk about performance. And David Lee Roth is, is, a, is a, a really intense guy. Rogan's not that far off it, but, but David Lee Roth is really, really intense and very, very proud of, of who he is and where he came from and this Southern California thing. And they, he, t- he tells a brilliant story about it's all, in the, it's all in the rehearsal. He says it's all in the rehearsal. And he talks about... Um, he got his idea of what performance should be like from Benny Goodman and the big bands. And he said that these, these bands used to have a dance off kind of thing where they would pick four songs and Benny Goodman would be over here and this other band would be over here and there was money on it. People would lay money on it. And he said, that's how we got good. That's how we got good because our performance in those moments when we were playing in front of 10 people informed our performance in front of 80,000 people. And it goes back to that old thing in, in uh, Bounce or Gladwell's book about the Beatles and the 10,000 hours and the Reaper Band playing, you know, all the songs playing six times a day. Van Halen were playing five sets of 55 minutes every day for weeks on end. That's why we could talk about Van Halen 40 years later because he was putting the hard work in, you know. You, m- you must share that with me, by the way. I love, love to start to experience that. I would 100% agree with rehearsal and practice. And you mentioned deliberate practice and deep practice. But what's interesting, having worked with some of the top golfers and performers and, I guess, sports people in the world, that's one area that I think business can learn from. And, and you mentioned sales and marketing. A lot of your clients, of course, in that space, you know, rehearsals, practice long before you get to meet your client is absolutely everything. But a lot of the sales and marketing teams I've worked with, not having them better sales people or marketing people, but having them be a better team. Yeah. We have found it fascinating to understand that they don't rehearse enough, they don't review well enough, they don't practice well enough, yeah. uh, they're not getting good enough coaching, they yeah. don't do enough scenario planning, uh, they spend more time on the PowerPoint slides than they do on their rehearsal and the practice. So we're amazed by that. It's, I, see it, man, I see it all the time. And, and one of the questions I had down here was to discuss the importance of, like, people don't even like calling it training, you know, because you're training for what? It is a rehearsal. It's rehearsing. Like, um, I listen to people, I record their conversations and I then go through just basic what you've said and, you know, have you ever seen yourself talk? And they'd be laughing and I'm going, dude, you're talking to clients every single day. Why, why do you not want to see how good you could be? So like with clients, we're working on eloquence, speaking properly, it's elocution lessons. You know, the Peter Piper picked a piece of whatever slow down. Do you know what it sounds like to speak to somebody from the Moy? It's not good. Like, you know, you need to put the handbrake on. And I, I learned that over in London. I couldn't understand why people couldn't understand me. I thought like, a, you know, I, you know, I'm academic, like, and here, boy, do you want to buy one of those? Like, you know, and all that. And whenever you're working in the rigors of business, and that goes from the top down, that goes from senior management decision-making, they don't get to rehearse the decision-making. You know, and, and the girl that came in to clean your office didn't rehearse that. She's been cleaning that way since she's become a cleaner. Yeah, well, that's, that's again, just adding to that, I suppose it links into practice, it links into communication, it links into analyzing and reviewing how well we communicate. I have to be honest, my, my northern brogue, I have to work extremely hard at it uh, because I do tend to speak far too fast. And especially when working with international clients, very often even in the middle of a virtual session, I get a little message in from a, a virtual client who'll say, and please slow down. You're, <laughs> you're Northern Ireland broke. You need to slow it down for us. You've got Chinese, Russian, Italians, North Americans, South Americans, Puerto Ricans, whatever. So it's a big work on. And I think for all of us Northern folk, we, we need to be very aware of that our marketplace now is global. Yeah. Technology allows us to sell and trade and be commercial in a global context, but we have to modify our brogue, never lose our DNA and what's very unique about 
Ulster and Northern Irish people. I'm very proud to say that. I'm very proud to say I'm from Ulster. I'm an Irish man. But more than anything else, I think it was Bruce Lee who famously said, when, when he was asked what nationality was he, was he Chinese, was he Hong Kong, was he American? He says, no, I'm a human being. Yeah. And I think in this, in this time of uh, Black Lives Matter and this time of huge Me Too movements, we need to remind ourselves that, number one, it's not about whether they're a Protestant or a Catholic in that little tiny colloquial uh, province of ours. It's not whether we're black or white. It's not whether we're Irish or English or Unionists or Loyalists or uh, Nationalists or Puerto Rican or Jamaican or Chinese. We're all human beings. And now more than ever, I think, individuals and businesses will do much better if we're able to show that we can respect no matter what color you are, no matter whether you're uh, gay or straight, lesbian or bi, you know, we, we have to be. That is now a fundamental requirement in business. If we're not like that in business, I can tell you from a company we spoke to earlier on, it's a key criteria that rules you in or out. They asked us today, very first question, and the uh, can you please advise us? What is your DNI policy in your organization? Can you share it with us, please, during this call, live on this session? Boom. If I wasn't able to share that with them, then and there, in the conversation, out the bloody door. Yeah, that's my Northern Irish twang coming through. Yeah. So how, how did I get on to that? We mentioned communication. You mentioned getting people to slow down. Absolutely imperative that we respect who we're communicating to by getting that pitch, pause, pace, volume, tone, language, stories, colloquial, uh, let's say, insights appropriate. Uh, that, yeah, I, it's probably unfair to say this because it has all sorts of different connotations, but I, from where I see it, and certainly high-performance selling, and, the, and I'm working with a couple of people who are high-performing, like they're, they're based in, in Ireland and they're dropping maybe a quarter of a million plus in their, their pay packet. Like they're working at a real high level. And what defines those people is that they understand that if they don't, if they can't make themselves understood, it is game over. And you sort of put, put, the, put the comparison with theater, you know, like all, we, what, what, what's the, the second biggest pastime or the first biggest pastime during COVID was Netflix. Everybody was watching movies flat out and we're judging these movies on their ability to entertain us. They didn't, just didn't step out of the change rooms onto the screen. They rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. And they're told, they, they get told by audience figures, they get told by their coaches, their voice coaches, they get told by their directors how good they are. All the time there's validation of the effort that they put in. And when you're looking at this in the context of selling, there's this idea that, you know, I'm as only as good as the last sale I did and the sale wasn't too bad, you know? And it isn't like that. It's if, if you really genuinely want to improve and fulfill that John Wooden to be the very best that you can, then you have to do those things. And you need a management team around that are creating a culture or, or allowing a culture of that kind of performance, you know, of that kind of mentality. And um, I don't. I see a few of them, you know. But I think you know. It's 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 almost refreshing to hear that not everybody's doing it perfectly at the, at your level, you know. No, not in fact the opposite. Yeah, I would say the big the norm the, the trends we see in the biggest businesses and right down to the small business that we work with in Northern Ireland, you, you see a trend of never you know nowhere near the level of rehearsal required to land a big contract nowhere near the level of attention to detail on understanding the customer needs. It's, you know, really where it's going to be at. Nowhere near the level of, you know, communication articulation practice. So I would say that's, that, is, that is a much bigger trend than the organizations we meet, no matter what size they are, who are as good as Ireland Rugby were under Joe Schmidt at rehearsing, practicing, coaching yeah. the fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's where sport can kind of play a very, very important role in showing an example of what happens when the rehearsal is meticulous. That's one that really, we can learn a lot from sport there, but yeah. also sport can learn a lot from business. For example, in let's say, talk about things like forecasting, budgeting, that even GA local clubs are going to have to become brilliant at if they want counties, to survive. Counties are going to have to be good at it, you know. 
<laughs> not organizational. The whole the GA is an organization. The, the, you know, soccer in Northern Ireland yeah. uh, is going to have to learn that because otherwise we're quite a business. That's right. Yeah, that's the yeah. They we're pivoting back and forward there at, at, at a de- at a deadly rate, but it it makes it makes a lot of sense. You know, um, do you mind if I go back to? Uh, I want to pull back to something you didn't want to talk about at the beginning, but uh, 2002, what culture was there around that unit going into September? That culture started in 1996 for me in November when I joined the squad. For Kieran McGinney, that started probably in 1991. For Paul McGrain and Jamie Morrison, who you've met in the past lives, that would have started way back probably 92. For my brother Justin, that would have started in 1985. For Brian McAlinden, who was there as the coach before, Joe Kiernan, it probably started back in 1977. Mm-hmm. So when we're building a high-performance culture, that's the thing we need to identify. If you're building a willing, and again, some people will always say, but hold on a minute, Enda and, and Paul, what does a, a high-performance culture look like? A winning culture. Yeah, teams and business that win for the long term, right? So that that culture was built over, in some cases, ten years, some cases even twenty years. From Armagh getting the Ireland final in nineteen seventy seven. Obviously, Joe was one of the players. Obviously, Brian McAlinden was one of the players. Uh, so that that took a huge amount of heavy lifting by a lot of people over a twenty five year period to lay the foundation stones of good quality coaches on the ground at in nurseries right around Armagh, where I was lucky enough to be brought up in a nursery uh, on a Sunday morning in Mullaban, where Charlie Grant, Joe McNulty, uh, you know, and some of those other older men would have had us all playing football as six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. We have to think about when a team wins in 2002, what were these guys doing at six? What were they doing at seven? What were the Throne team doing 25 years ago? That's what I'm interested in, not what Mickey did with them when they got to 2003. That, that's the easy part. Going yeah. back to the, the Gary Neville chat and, and Phil Neville, the easy part is actually working with a high performer is actually very easy. Yeah. Working with people way down the, uh, the performance chain in business that have never won anything, that have never you know, been part of an unbelievably successful tribe, that's a bloody challenge. Yeah. So yeah. Joe can come in in 02 with a very strong culture already built. Joe Kiernan came in in 02 with a team that had leaders in every line. Joe Kiernan came in in 02 with a, an unbelievably thick, tough group of probably 30 people. Joe Kiernan came in in 02 with a team that had already done six or seven years of unbelievable physical, mental conditioning. Joe Kearney came in in 2 with a team that already won a lot of big games in Crow Park uh, as minors, you know, and then obviously won with Queen's University, won with Cross with Glen, won with Mullabon. Uh, Joe Kearney came in the door with a group of people that were already developing very strong winning IQ. And then what he did was he, was, he orchestrated that even better. He pulled that even closer. He, he gave us even more belief in our ability he, he made the conditioning even more fine-tuned with John McCluskey, another guy who's been very, obviously, yeah. instrumental at Queen's University. He brought in Paul Grimley, who brought a huge intensity to the rehearsal and her tackling. Uh, he, he brought a sense of, you know, confidence in ourselves that not only could we beat the Curies or the Dublins, but we could do it consistently. We did do it unbelievably consistently over a 10-year period but probably not consistently enough at semi-final and final stage. You like you, some of the. <clears throat> I could we could do a podcast alone on this conversation, but I don't. And I don't want to do that. But it's a fascinating story, and and you know, um, you talk about leadership across the line. Like you, some of the names, and well, not you know, Barcelona had all of those names. Dublin in the last few years had all of those names. It's not just reliant on one or two people on the pitch. Everybody kind of steps up and creates this, this like leadership position, not relying on your captain, Kieran, or not, not relying on Pep Guardiola. Well, everybody's allowed. So, so like that, that uh, you have to have a lot of confidence. You have to have a lot of resilience. You have to have technical expertise. Um, and that takes a lot of creating. It just doesn't happen overnight for sure. Yeah, for sure. 
we're lucky to be honest with you. And again, that's why we need to thank our parents. Yeah. We need to thank the mentors in the clubs that raised all of those young players. So, you know, I know that you're very passionate and from the Moy and later on, I want to link in a story of last Christmas on the Moy pitch doing a training session. I'll tell you who I was doing it with uh, in a few moments. But I think that for your listeners to really understand that our leadership group, the reason that it was so rich happened 30 years ago, 25 years ago, 40 years ago, because of the upbringing we all got, whether that was in uh, North Armagh or South Armagh, the schooling we got in the Abbey or the, uh, the Coleman's or Pat's Armagh, like yourself, Paul, you know, and what we learned in the basketball court, what we learned, uh, you know, literally in, in the school lessons that I had with Val Keen, who obviously was the famous uh, DJ and Val Keen down dynasty. Right. Yeah. We were lucky, Paul, that was all forged long before we ever got near uh, the canal end or, or Hill 16. So that, that, that's last class because, uh, you know, the, this ongoing conversation about that I have with, with clients who want to mold these teams and I'm talking about deep, deliberate or purposeful practice, you know, and what needs to be done. But, but th- those ingredients aren't in any book, you know. They're pointless putting them in because it's, an, it's a legacy. It's, it's, it's really what the foundation of the book legacy doesn't talk about. Like nobody talks about that DNA, really. They talk about it like everybody who's born in, you know, everybody who's born in South Africa wants to play for the Springboks or whatever. Everybody who's born in Auckland wants to play for the All Blacks. If you're an RMI, you want to play for RMI and so on and so forth. But there's so much of a perfect storm that needs to be created around you. Like Corm- Corm- Cormac's, Cormac's uncle was Peter O'Neill. And Peter, Peter O'Neill was played in Tyrone and he, he was in the panel in 86. And I would say Peter was really, really incredibly influential in Cormac and Donald in, in the schooling that they would have got outside of school. You know? And um, yeah, that's interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, well, you, you mentioned your, your clients there, Paul, and you mentioned about, you know, they're, they're asking you about how do they build that culture, that long term, let's call it leadership pipeline of talent. My, my first advice on that would always be, I remember going to the Seattle Seahawks back in 2007 or 8 to spend a month with learning from them about all aspects of their culture. Were you with Gervais, were you? Uh, no, uh, sorry, apologies. I, I got to know Gervais very well. Apologies, my, my apologies. It was with the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. I since got to know the Seattle Seahawks and Mike Gervais is a really good guy. But I went and spent time with the Pittsburgh Steelers, who are owned by an Irishman, of course, from Newry originally, Dan Rooney. So the Pittsburgh Steelers owned by an Ar- a Northern Irish, a Newry original uh, family called the Rooneys. Believe it or not, Dan Rooney's mother was called McNulty from Newry when I met him on the pitch in the Pittsburgh Steelers. After the session, he said to me, where are you from? I said, Ireland. He says, whereabouts in Ireland? I said, Northern Ireland. He says, whereabouts in Northern Ireland? I says, Armagh. I kid you not. He says, whereabouts in Armagh? I says, a little place outside Newry. He says, whereabouts in Newry? Right? So Dan Rooney's mother was McNulty from Newry. Uh-huh. So I spent time with Dan Rooney in, uh, in Seattle and with the, uh, sorry, apologies, in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, they spoke about where they get the talent that builds the best Super Bowl winning teams, Right? Was it getting a 25-year-old that was a rock star going to be the best wide receiver? Or how did they get that top talent? And companies want to know, how do we develop the top leadership talent or winning culture and winning teams? Well, the answer is, what, what's happened with the six-year-old? If you want to win anything with business, we need to get the right talent under the team, as Jim Collins would say. Yeah. Most companies, and I've made all the mistakes myself, we're not doing enough work long before they ever get near the team. Because if we get rotten, toxic underperforming, uh, self-centric, egotistical, arrogant, ignorant, sloppy, and this is your listeners are going end of your way over the top here. No, you're if not. that's the team that I'm given, by God, I'm some leader to turn that around. Yeah. Why would I do that to myself? I'd rather go along and be really prescriptive with the qualities, the characteristics, the attributes, the values, the character yeah. that I want to bring into my team that I can develop and coach into a high performance team. And Joe Kiernan, when he came along, to go back to your O2 analogy, when Joe Kiernan came along, that's what he had. 
Yeah. And, and, and to a large degree, Mickey had it in 2003, you know. The team that, that Mickey uh, sort of inherited, um, albeit he, 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 was, he was able to mould them a lot for a lot longer than Joe did um, because he had them from minors and that. And, and he, had, he had personal skin in the game with his children and, and so on and so forth. But, but that, really do, that really does help. And um, again, amateur sport probably is very different. You know, Arma Tyrone. Let's leave, let's leave Dublin out for a second, but Armagh and Tyrone are, are certainly different to the Seattle Seahawks who, who have kind of a bottomless pit of money. Um, I, I'd followed uh, Michael Gervais for, for uh, uh, quite, a, quite a while. He, I heard him interviewing Angela Duckworth on the podcast about seven or eight years ago. And last year, actually, no, this year, I did an online program with him, which was about um, his finding mastery, I think it is. And it was all about resilience. And then COVID just landed in the middle of it. And you could just see, well, this is kind of appropriate. <laughs> you know, I can start using some of this stuff now. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. So Steve Carroll, those guys are um, formidable enough now. Yeah. And I, I, listen, I, I'm conscious of time. And we've been, we've, been, we've been on here for about an hour or so. Um, and it seemed like only five minutes. It's been uh, really, really insightful and uh, really enjoyed it. Man. No, take, take as long as you, you want to, to wrap this up in a nice... In a nice bow, we, we can take another five or ten minutes wrapping up. But I would hope, and I guess my plea to your your listeners, uh, and I know how loyal they are to you, and I know how much work you do to keep your network really alive and really strong. And I must uh, just uh, strongly commend you, that Paul. My my plea to them would be to have a really important meeting with themselves in the next week. I think the most important business meeting we'll ever have is with ourselves. I remember saying that to some of the guys in our team maybe four or five years ago and they're looking at me as if it had 10 heads and it's saying, go and have a good meeting with yourself over the weekend and have a really good, really honest conversation with yourself. Are you doing all you can do to be the best you can be? Are you organized yourself in business? Do you know your own goals? Do you know your own strengths or superpowers? Have you worked out your own biggest weaknesses? Have you got feedback on those? Do you know what your own plan for the next 90 days is before you sit down with your sales and marketing team? Do you know what you're passionate about? Are you working in a bloody company or a job or an industry you're passionate about? Have you thought about how you're going to pivot during COVID? If you haven't thought about it, you better think quick. Have you sat down to have a very honest conversation with your top clients and asked them to tell you straight with no sugar, what do you need to do better for them? And how do you possibly continue to be one of their vendors and how do they continue to be one of your clients? I, I think that if we don't do a huge amount of soul searching as business leaders, as team leaders, as business owners, as business owner managers at this time, when are we going to do it? I hope there's none of our listeners and that includes myself that have got an ounce of complacency remaining. None of us can deserve to be complacent. We all oh, well. are different in the bloody reality of the challenges of this COVID opportunity. Yeah, yeah. You take it, I mean, I'm not saying I don't take it seriously. I take it very seriously. And, but, but it's like taking it seriously is one thing, but having a toolbox of things to do to, to kind of shore up your own corner is very important, you know. Um, do you check in with yourself a lot, do you? Do you? Is it a daily thing with you? Is it morning and night or...? As and when you need to. Today I would have been very early this morning. It would have been the gym midday. I might, if I can, I'll either cycle home or I'll drive home this evening. Uh, for me, to be really honest, Paul, and really, I guess, showing vulnerability, if I don't have a very good almost resetting mechanism early in the morning or late at night, I'm not as resilient, I'm not as strong, I'm not as powerful, I don't perform as well, I don't make as much a positive impact, and I'm not as efficient. So that's the easy answer. That's a good answer, yeah. So, uh, but you also mentioned the kind of the burden of responsibility you have is to not just check out when you leave work, that you've got a series of responsibilities that you've got to deliver when you arrive home and you've got to check in, more importantly, with the guys at home. Like, so it's kind of a, it's again, it's a continuum. Like it's a law of, it's like just, it's about always being checking in. It's checking in all the time, I guess. I'm not good, to be honest with you, I have a huge amount of growth in all those areas. I'm excited about that, Paul. I'm, I'm humbled by it and I'm bloody challenged by it. I'm really excited about how much more I can still grow in all those areas of my life. 
and I think what a powerful message for your listeners, no matter how far we've come in the last 10 or 20 years in business or in whatever the crucible we're performing in is, we can all infinitely grow if we have that right mindset, if we get that right coach, if we practice well enough, as you say, if that purpose is clear enough, if we're passionate enough about it, if we see mistakes and failures as merely an opportunity to start more intelligently, you know, imagine how much more we can grow. It's just amazing. Did you always think like that? Was that you had a, a very fertile learning ground at home from your brothers and your parents and your, that, that community? But did, did you always feel that, that that was kind of your position? Or did you grow into this over more recently? Or Yeah, I think I've done that really quickly over 25 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I did it really easily over 25 years. Of If you've seen my house in Dublin, you'd see that there's – probably two and a half thousand books. In fact, if I can show you some of the books. You can see away up there on the shelves in the office here. Yeah, I'll talk you through some of the books. So your listeners, I'm turning the laptop around. The, the leadership books that would have formed our thinking, whether it's from uh, Mr. Shackleton to Mr. Daniel Pilk to Mr. Michael Lewis to Oprah Winfrey, whether it's the team books, whether it's the mindset books, whether it's the book we're, we're lucky enough to have uh, curated ourselves, commit through to uh, what books we've got up here, winning books, through to coaching books, through to well-being books. That's a snapshot of the books here in, in the virtual, uh, sorry, in, in the physical office, uh-huh. uh, uh, to be honest with you. So I've done it really fast over 25 years, and I'm really frustrated that I don't know nearly enough. And that's been really straight and really honest. No, it's... it's um... You're not working with that client portfolio because you're you're taking up space on the table. Like it's evidently your value. It's evident where your value comes, and uh, and I think that um, I'm I'm it's a real it's class thing to have you on this podcast this evening now. So I've I've really enjoyed it. There's also I know that people will want to get in touch with you or want to follow up more about you. Your website is mcnultyperformance.com. Delighted to have and add value, and hopefully I'll be collaborating with you in some endeavors. It's all about collaboration now. So. Let's keep it open. Listen, we will do, man. Thank, I really thank you. It's it's nearly um, it's ten it's ten to nine here, so that's that's been uh, that's been first class, man. I'm just going to try and um, give you a chance to say good night. Thank you, and we'll uh, I'll catch up with you again soon.